What's up, everybody? I'd like to welcome y'all back to the Real Talk with Real Estate Investors show. And we've got a great person in store for you guys today. Uh, he, man, this guy is a mortgage pro. He is one of the most experienced, most knowledgeable, most helpful individuals I know. He has done well over 500 transactions in his, in his career over the past 15 years in mortgage. Uh, he's actually also a business partner of mine and one and one of my investing businesses. Man, I am super excited to welcome you, Henry Araujo, to the show. Welcome. Thanks, Trevor. I appreciate doing? it, man. Doing great, man. Glad that you guys had me on the show. I'm finally going to watch some big names that came through on here and then finally get an opportunity to uh, to to be in the, the seat here. So thank you. Yeah. It's great to have you here, man. I can't wait to hear your story and all the stuff that you're going to share with us today, man. It's going to be exactly. it is exciting to have you here, brother. For Thank sure, you. man. Yeah, we've got what about sixteen thousand real estate folks involved with real estate here in the group itself. Some are real estate investors, so of course, you know, I know that you're going to have some things to share with that. Um, in addition, you know, a lot of these folks, you know, are are needing uh, mortgage uh, tips, tricks, secrets, and so forth. We've got a ton of real estate agents here, so man, we're just looking forward to you bringing bringing the value in the game and. And, and dropping some value bombs on us today, man. So, uh, you know, let's go and get started, man. I'd like to kind of take you down a trip down memory lane and kind of figure out where Henry Araujo started and how he came about. Yeah, man. It, um, I, I'm originally from a small town in Illinois. I always say I'm from Chicago, but because no one is going to know where Streeter, Illinois is. It's a small farm town about an hour outside. So um, growing up, I realized there's two options when I was back home, you know, I was going to be either working in a, in a factory somewhere or, you know, kind of just doing a, the small farm town life. And it, it was just something that I wasn't, I didn't have a passion for nothing wrong with it. I mean, a lot of my family and friends still do it, but um, knew it wasn't for me. So as soon as uh, I graduated, I pretty much packed up and went into the city and went to college and then had an opportunity to to get in the mortgage industry and I said well I mean I don't really know much about mortgage and at that time my, my boss said well all you got to do man here's just come into my office sit down I'm going to teach you some things so I said all right well I went in he goes all you need to do first is get me social security numbers and I said okay and he slams <laughs> up slams a slams a stack of lead sheets in front of me and I was like what do I do and he goes well there's a phone number you call and you know get an application we're doing refinances and I said I got gotcha. you fair enough and we uh we started we started calling and god it was it was miserable for the first few times I mean I, I hey this is Henry uh can I get your social security number you want to refine it you know <laughs> had no idea of what I was doing and obviously that doesn't that doesn't bode well for you when you're just calling somebody and and asking that so it was uh it, it was definitely a uh, a lesson learned very early in the in the career. So, let me take it back just a little bit farther than that. When you were in college, did you feel like that mortgage was your calling, or did you have a few shit jobs before that that just was like, God, you know, maybe it was on the farm. And obviously, that wasn't for you. But hey, you know, Pizza Hut, whatever. There's something that yeah. was going on that was like, <laughs> man, I don't want to do this anymore. There's got to be something better out there for me. While I was in college, I. Um, I was working for Chase. I, I've actually worked for a bank, um, bank one, and then they got bought out by Chase. I worked in their credit card department. It was a really interesting job, but I didn't bet. pay very, very much at all. And in, you know, in college, like I was making 12 or $13 an hour. So I thought, oh, you're crushing enough money. It. Yeah, I was right. doing great, man. I could have whatever I needed at that time. It's covered all my beer money and, and whatever else I wanted to do. So I was happy, but, um, school, I did good, but man, it just, just not me. I, I can't stand sitting in the classroom and having to, to go through all of that. And I had an opportunity. Yeah, dude, it's, it's rough. It's not the, it's not fun. You know, I, it's not for me. It's not what I like to do. And once I, I actually met my manager at the mortgage company through Chase while we were declining his credit cards on a numerous oh, <laughs> that's crazy. And, yeah you start Decline, looking at, declined your credit can i get a job <laughs> yeah no and i well he was i was in a special division so we we continually were getting um we were stopping his cards so i had to call him every day hey was this your purchase that you bought something from europe was this year that you got gas on your card and he was just always constantly yeah and finally was like hey how much do you get paid here and i was like oh you know it's good and he's like you in the 
suburbs? And I said, yeah. And so he goes, well, you know, here's my cell phone. You see it right there. He goes, if you ever want to give me a call, let me know. And I said, well, okay, well, it's fine. And I uh, put in some vacation time at Chase to just do something. Who knows what it was? I mean, I might have just wanted a day off to go hang with my buddies or something, but um, they declined it. And that really just ticked me off because all my buddies were going to do something. And I, I finally, once I got it approved, I put in my two weeks uh, vacation right then and there and went over to uh, the office in Algonquin and sat down with him. He said, well, what are you doing? I said, I took my vacation. So I'm here for two weeks. You know, I'm going to, I want to see what you've got about it. And he goes, this was still oh. Chase. This I was still with Chase. Company. And I went to the mortgage company to, to sit with Ed, the guy who, uh, I was always stopping his credit card and he goes, well, what if you don't like this? And I said, mm, I'm, that's why I'm trying. He goes, yeah, but you're going to take your whole two week vacation right now. And you know, I hadn't really thought about that. And I was right. like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. So you knew what you the- didn't want to do anymore, right? Yeah. I was mad, man. I didn't have any freedom. And you know, I'm like, well, I just wanted a day off. So it wasn't like I was, you know, trying to just blow off work. I was requesting a day off and just working for somebody was starting to get starting to wear on me you know I just didn't like the didn't like being told no on on just (laughs) taking a day off if I want to and you know he rest was kind of history with that I got you so Ed Ed is the one that got you kind of started with in the mortgage business where it all kind of started now tell us a little bit about that I know that you used to kind of pound pound the phone smile and dial let me get a social you turn it on over you know and try to work work some deals together what was that like at first at first it was super intimidating, man. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I was literally just trying to get someone to say yes. And then just handing off a file and then going to learn, you know, and obviously at that time, things were a little different with, with licensing and stuff. Nowadays, you'd be, (laughs) you'd have, you'd be state regulators would be all over you if you were doing that but while I started like a boiler learning room type atmosphere uh, no, no kind of but not really I mean obviously it was on the it was on most of it was on the there was nothing that was being done illegally or anything of that nature but we were just handing them off I didn't know what I was I was getting a yes and that was the end of it and we were moving on well I finally got a got a yes and went and sat down and he was like, here's what you're going to do. Here's the disclosure package. And so I drove all over the Metroplex because at that time we didn't have e-signatures. Things weren't, you know, digitally done. So you'd print a loan package that was, you know, two or three inches thick with a bunch of signatures. And you drive out to someone's house, sit down with them, get them to sign everything. And I come back and, and we'd go price it with whatever investor we were going to send it to. And, and that was, uh, that was kind of it. How long do you, would you say that it took you before you got that first yes? The first yes was actually very quick. The second yes was was the uh, was the hard part. The You're like, yeah, I'm in the right place. Then, <laughs> yeah, the, the first yes I, I'll never forget. I had called and it was this lady Alice and she just uh, Alice Ward and we talked and I said I'm looking to do a refinance for you and she goes oh great it was actually something I was wanting to do and it just it blew me off. I was like what is, what's going on here? She's really yes. So I'm like okay well here let me collect some of this information. I took it back to my boss and I said, here, I've got this social. And he looked at me kind of weird and he was like, really? And I said, yeah, she's waiting for a call back to go over everything that we're going to do. And he goes, okay. And so we sat down, but the second, yes, no, that was, uh, that was probably, uh, that was probably another month or so. I I got that. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was rough. And I mean, we only worked from four to seven. So I took a two week vacation uh, from work only to find out that I got off at five every day at, at Chase. So I could have easily been over 25 minutes through the Metroplex to, to go over and work here. But all we were doing was calling power hour. People were getting off of work and coming home. So it was the best time to cold call. Sure. And How many calls we, were you making? God, I couldn't tell you, man. We're 50, A couple, 60, few hundred. <laughs> yeah. No, we we're going to 50 or 60 of them. I mean, because people actually talk to you. People were picking up the phone. Oh, five. I mean, cold calls people would pick up the phone when they saw a number coming through. It wasn't now where you've got so much spam and everything coming through that was making it um, there. So you would get some conversations with people, but you know, it was still the point. I didn't know what I was doing. So (laughs) that was, that was a a little bit of a a learning curve as well that I had to adjust to. Now, if you're making 50 or 60 calls a day, um, that's somewhere probably, you know, that's well over a thousand, you know, over the course of a month. 
Man, oh, how God. frustrating was that for you? Like, did you have some opportunities where you're like, screw this, I'm done, I ain't oh, oh, no, well, or anything the, like that? Well, yeah, kind of, because right after I got that first paycheck from closing that the Alice Ward deal, I made I made like fifty five hundred dollars on that transaction, and I went to Chase and I put my two weeks in right then and there. I was like, well, I'm done. I, this is more than I make in two months here. I'm I'm out. And so it was fearful because my parents were upset that I was now going to just jump into this whole new thing and college started to become less and less important to me. And um, they were mad. So that was no, no going back to mom and dad for any type of help or, Hey mom, I, I'm, I'm hungry. It was cans of corn and ramen noodles, man, was like my, my main, my main course for, for mm -hmm. several meals. And, but I mean, I just couldn't quit because I was, there was nothing else to do. You know, I had to make sure it was going to work and it eventually did. And right when I thought I had it all figured out for, for a couple of years and doing these cold calls, uh, the mortgage industry crashed. And that was, uh, uh that was definitely a, a significant impact in my life of somewhere where I didn't think I was money was really easily obtained at that point in time for me to now our office is going to be closing so it was, and uh, what was that like you know like take us back to that moment in time did you think that it was all over this is where it ends you know were you thinking you know I, i'm just kind of curious because you know everybody there's a lot of folks that we've had had on the show that that were that were around that time and each of them had a different perspective but ultimately everybody was like oh man what what are we going to do now you know, so tell us a little bit about, you know, things from your perspective when, when that big hit happened. It, I remember I was driving into work that day and, you know, I started hearing things on the radio and, and it's really odd. And I wasn't, I was still young, man. I could care less about a lot of the news and things that were going on. And I, I was learning mortgage enough to where it was starting to be impactful to, to pay attention to the, to the market, but nothing that was too crazy. And then my boss called me and he's like, Hey, did you lock these loans? And I said, well, I think so. You know, maybe I'm not hundred percent sure. Let's, let's get in. He goes, well, no, this bank and this bank, they're no longer taking applications from us. And I was like, okay, well, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, we'll just go somewhere else to a different, different bank. Well, when we get in, I sit down and look and then it's like IndyMac, New Century, all these banks were just closing one after another, after another, no longer originating. So that was my first like, oh shit moment. Cause I'm like, what, what's going to happen now? What I just started making money and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know? And college was still kind of at that point where people thought it was a very important uh, portion. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? I, I haven't been in school for three and a half years. Um, I don't have a job. Our office is looking like it's going to close. I went from I being talk able to talk to my parents with my children. Yeah, man. <laughs> and the one thing that they were so mad at, you know, it's all commission. They were like, you're, this is stupid. It's such a bad investment for you. This is dumb. You're, you're, you're going to piss your whole future away. And I was like, well, no, I've got to, I've got to make it work. And our account executive that next day was like, Hey man, um, I know you guys are about to, your shop's probably going to be closing soon. I've got an opportunity down in Texas for you, really. And well, luckily my brother had lived here and I said, well, where at? And he goes, um, it'll be in Plano. And I said, oh, okay. And he tells me where the streets were, 121 to Legacy. And I knew that my brother lived by Legacy in the colony. So I said, well, I'm definitely interested. And he said, okay. So I got a phone call from recruiter at Countrywide. Uh, booked me a, an interview for Monday. Uh, I left that that Sunday, drove down here and interviewed on Monday. I drove back Monday night. Tuesday, he offered me the position. And on Wednesday, I packed up everything I could in my car. And down here I went and haven't turned back, man. It was, uh, it was definitely a, a different experience coming from what I was doing of just cold calling all the time to starting at Countrywide. And it was press a button and there were people that wanted to do a mortgage you know they were wanting to refinance their home where coming out of where I was who knows what that person was doing they may have been at the grocery store or something when I'm calling them and these people really wanted to do business so they're like yeah you've got to keep so much available time and it just blew my mind that you mean I press this button right here on the phone and it's going to ring and someone wants to do business with me rather than me having to break down the wall 
well, that really helped me out significantly just in the fact that like it, it I didn't have to build this huge rapport like I had to immediately with someone answering the phone, you know, begging them, don't hang up. Let me explain this to you. Please, and, please, please, please. No, 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 no. Yeah. Let, no more uh, getting cussed me, out, you know, no more. Like, yeah. You're the 30th person to call me in the last 10 minutes. It, exactly. So it was, it was really uh, an eye opening experience and it, it allowed me to really excel at that position. And, as I started to excel there, then Countrywide obviously went through their their stuff with Bank of America, and um, they tra- they were transitioning me off of sales for a little bit, and that really <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was I was really upset, and at first I'm like, this is stupid. I, I moved all the way down to Texas for this position, and now you're moving me into a loss mitigation role. And, and how quickly? Done. Since you- uh, probably about a, probably about a year after I've been with Countrywide, that whole the transition started happening, and then they, you know, all those modifications that were going on, no one knew what to do. So they just took a whole bunch of us to field phone calls and call people and try to collect payments for this, and, and none of us knew what we were doing. I mean, it was a it was a very very unorganized event that we were going through, and at first I was really upset and pissed off, like why because I've packed up my whole life to come here to to work in this loss mitigation. It didn't sound exciting. There was no commission. And my brother just said, you know, you should be thankful for the opportunity. And I'm like, well, he goes, what if you excel at it? You could probably, you can get a management, you can get a whole bunch of things. And, I, and that kind of turned my, my vision at that point. And I, I got an opportunity to manage a loss mitigation team for a while. And that was my first sample of, of management that was um, having people respect me and, and look at me in a different manner than just the way I was, you know, in, in the call center as, as another employee. So I uh, worked with a great group of people and eventually I just, I needed to go back to mortgage. I mean, that's what I needed, the sales portion of it I, I wanted. And so I wound up uh, leaving Bank of America at that point in time. I went to Capital One and had a had a great, great time. I mean, that was the biggest start into where I was at. I knew everything front and backside and had the processing portion of, of what was needed because what we had to do with the loss mitigation and the knowledge I gained on the backside of things really helped me with the sales portion because I could answer a lot of the questions that normally I would just kind of brush off because it was an operations question, you know, something about payments or service afterwards that none of us really knew about, but I had to deal with it for such a long time that it, it, uh, it, it really worked advantageous for me. What, about what year was this, by the way? Uh, 2013. So it was a, there was a good five year hiatus where things were still a mess. And, 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 um, it was about three years. Cause I was with, I was with bank. I was with, um, I was in the sales department for a while, then they were transitioning us. So um, it was about three years that I, I managed I managed at Bank of America on the loss mitigation side. And then I, I decided it was time to, to make the jump over into Looking back into sales. Settle. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. It, it did. And I mean, that, that was really, I had a couple of the guys that I worked with at Countrywide and they're like, man, it's, this is awesome. And I mean, that's when all of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac refinance programs were coming out. So it was... Uh, it was it was a very lucrative time and we, really fun time of making money at that point. I got you. Wow. So let me ask you this: Then what made things different in 2011, getting back into mortgage from when you went pr- in prior to the crash? What changes were made? What uh, you know solutions to previous challenges were done? How were, was it the same? game that it was before and if so was it better or worse or you know was it just as much fun you know tell us a little bit about that the game definitely was different i mean back when when i started you know we had almost you had a pulse and you could you could get into a you could get into a home i mean on, there was a lot of a lot of programs that enabled a strong credit score to be able to get you 100 percent financing on a home that you may or may not be able to qualify for and obviously with, you know, 2011 and 2013 coming through with you've got TRID and all of these new guidelines that came in place to prevent us from going through the hardships that, that happened in, you know, 2008. I mean, there was a lot of people that just didn't know 
what type of mortgage program they were in. They didn't have any clue. They just knew that they were getting into this house. Well, unfortunately, there was a lot of people who were deceitful and, and getting them into negative amortization loans. So all this stuff is, is just piling on the back end of your mortgage. If you have three options to make your full payment an interest only payment or a half payment, what do you think most people are going to do eventually? They're, they're going to go with that, that lower payment because they don't really know the, the repercussions or consequences that are going to ensue later on down the road. And then the biggest part is when those interest rates start adjusting and they were, you know, obviously at that time, our economy was going in the right direction. So interest rates were, you know, six, seven, eight percent for people. And then they start adjusting. And I mean, they were, it was making it impossible for people to afford their homes to stay in. So um, once I started seeing that, that really made me want to make sure that I was providing the education with every client and taking the time to make sure that they understand. I mean, every single one of my clients to this day, like I, I, First thing I start with is I am huge on communication and education. There's no question that I want you to go on ask. I mean, the biggest problem that we had when that crash happened was the fact that most people had no idea what kind of loan they were in. They didn't, they, they didn't know it was an adjustable. They didn't know they had a, a prepayment penalty on it. They didn't know the fees they were paying. They just knew that if they needed to in a few months, they could refinance their house and they'd get more cash out if they needed it. So people were just, I mean, they were just, frivolously spending and it was it's sad because unfortunately they were put into a situation where they they were set up for failure right out of the gate um, that's crazy yeah no doubt that's that's definitely tough and and i'm sure that you know to a certain degree you know that your job got a lot harder you know when you went back because you know now everybody didn't necessarily qualify for that for the house you know and, and you and you had to to pivot in a sense to to really, you know, make sure that you had a qualified candidate and then take that extra time, you know, to, to educate them, walk them through the process and make sure that everything is right for them, uh, you know, to, to do the right thing. And that's one of the things that I definitely admire about you is that you know, that's something that's never changed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. as, the, as the housing market's gotten good or bad or, or whatever, you know, your philosophy has st stayed the same across the board, which is helping folks out, educating them, making sure that they're getting the right loan for them and not the right loan for you um of course so uh you know and 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 and, and you've actually taken that and, and you've built a team you know with those same morals and values tell us a little bit about what it's like going from the little guy on the totem pole and working your way into a management role to being in that management role and bringing other folks up to where you're at um the biggest thing for me was I, when I was a loan officer and I was working in, I was in the call centers for, with Capital One and I, I enjoyed it. And I mean, there's, it was a great, great opportunity, a great time to, to thrive. And everybody that I talked to that was there that had been loan officers in the retail side, which means you're out building relationships, you're out generating your own business. We're in the call center. It's, you, you sit there and you're pressing a button and phone rings or leads are coming in, whatever the case may be there is business provided for you an opportunity where in the retail space, your phone's not going to ring unless you're doing something to, to make that happen. So when I was initially there, there was people who had failed in the retail world in the call center. And they're like, you don't want to, you don't want to make this jump. Listen, it's you have to talk to realtors and it's the hardest thing ever. And they're just a nightmare to deal with. And it's just, it's just horrible. And, you sit there and you believe that for a little bit, but the reality of it is the reason that person's in that call center with me and hates that is because they failed at that position. They couldn't do it. Bro. They couldn't do it. And you start hearing this and then you see that there, you may be a great loan officer and you know your job inside and out, but out cultivating that relationship, you're probably struggling and that's where it was, or you're lazy. I mean, and that's the reality of it. It's, it's really easy to press that button. It's you definitely have to work to close the deal, but you only have to work to close the deal. You don't have to work to first generate that business. And a lot of people will work to generate the relationship and then they forget to do the business portion of it. So um, I, I finally was looking at it, had a couple of buddies that were like, man, I love this. This industry is, is great. I'm doing, um, look at the money I'm making. I said, you know what? I'm going to make the jump. And we had finally made the jump over and 
I, I love it, man. You, you, you get to sit down, you, you get an opportunity for one. I don't have to answer to anybody but myself. If, if things aren't working, it's primarily my fault. I mean, if I don't have business, it's because I'm not working hard enough. And as long as you're out constantly grinding and hustling and trying to find that next lead, that next bit of business, that next relationship, I mean, you're, you're going to be fine. I mean, it's not something that's easy. I mean, the first probably three months of being in the retail space, I was, I was drowning because I mean, it, it is tough, man. You, you have to go out. Every agent has somebody that they work with, you know, every title company already has mortgage guys that are coming in there that have been in there that have provided them years of business or friendship or whatever the case may be. So it was really knocking down a lot of walls and, and just making people like, and trust me. And once I got that down, I mean, it's, it's tenfold different, man. And then getting to, I, I started to coach a couple of people, just kind of new loan officers and they followed behind me. And one of them being Tucker, who's followed me everywhere and has just totally trusted his entire career with me is, is something that it speaks tenfold for him, but it makes me want to strive to be better every more. Cause I mean, he put his trust into me. If I fail, I'm going to fail not only myself and my family, but him and his family. So um, I enjoy that pressure because it, it makes it so rewarding when, you know, when he had his first huge month and he was just like, this, this is really a paycheck. It made me remember when I had gotten that first paycheck when I was just cold calling, like, this is really all mine. Right. And he, it, it's been awesome, man. And I, I, I enjoy giving my knowledge whenever I've got an opportunity up to, to provide to them and um, watching them reap the benefits of, of some hard work. Man, I'm glad you bring this up because, you know, I've seen a lot of people in this industry that they just, they, they don't be, they're not successful at this point because they listen to others, you know? And I see a lot of people in this industry always talking all this kind of shit, man. Like, no, it's hard. You're not going to make it and all that stuff. Like find something else. It's like, why in the fuck you get in this industry to start with? This is going to be exactly. your opinion. And this is how you're going to, this is why you're going to speak to others. You know, if you haven't been successful, it's because you haven't put in the work. Simple as that. A hundred percent that way, man. And that, that's the problem is a lot of people don't have the discipline to, to sit down and know that they need to grind out some phone calls and they need to follow up with someone because there's not a reward right now for them. They, they don't want it, you know, and it's like working with someone who's credit challenged. Yeah. Right. They're, they're not going to, they're not going to be a deal right now. You are not going to get a paycheck from that person right now. But yeah. building that relationship and that trust, they're the most loyal people to you afterwards that you can imagine. Oh, that's awesome. But, you know, that's I, I can relate with you when, with your story in how at the beginning, you know, your parents were telling you you're going to about to ruin your fucking life because you're not going to go to college and all that stuff. And I went through the same stuff, man. Like, I didn't want to go to college. I went to college and I was miserable, man. I was like, this is not for me, man. Like, I, I'm not, mm -mm. I don't know what I'm doing here. But you have to take the leap like you did, you know, and you're going to have to go through struggle. You're going to have to go through a lot of stuff to find yourself and, and what makes you passionate and, and, and what you can enjoy. And this is exactly what happens to you. And now you're very successful, you know. And, and I mean, the big thing is, is where you're at right now, you've already been there. You're there. You know how to get there. If you take a, a risk and you fail. You can go right back where you were. I mean, what you just have to suck up some pride a little bit and say, OK, it didn't work. But at least at least, you know, you tried. And I mean, then maybe you go back to where you are and you you can game plan a little bit more and give it another go if you need to or just don't quit. And I mean, so many times I didn't know anybody here. And I used that as a crutch for a while because I was like, well, I don't know anyone here. So how am I going to get that that circle of business? You know, I don't I don't have a sphere of influence here. So I had to build all of that. All my family is in Illinois outside of my brother and, you know, his wife. So um, it was it was definitely a time to realize I'm either going to do this or I'm not. And I was, I mean, I could go to a call center at any point in time. So I was like, well, I mean, I'll, I'll do this until I've, I've ran my credit into the ground and, you know, spent every dollar that I can and we'll see. And I mean, it, it, it got scary for a little bit, but I, I just kept with it, man. And I, I had some, I've had some really good mentors along the way that have just believed in me and, and kept me, with a level head and not falling down that rabbit hole of negativity. And 
um, it, it's, it's paid dividends for me for sure. And it's, you know, it's, it's so easy to quit, you know what I mean? And, and, and to want to quit and to, to want to use, you know, the things that are happening in your personal life as a crutch and say, Hey, listen, I can't do this because of this or whatever, but I, you know, and I'm going to dig into your business, but I know you had every opportunity in the world to quit. You know what I mean? You had some things happen in your life that, that nobody's ever had to go through and probably most people never will. You know what I mean? But that that gave you, those hard things that happened in your life made you so much stronger for the comeback. Right. And so. Absolutely, man. I mean, we all we all have that that adversity. And I mean, it's just I'm not going to go back to anywhere that I've been because moving forward, there's just so many opportunities out there. I mean, within my mortgage career, obviously, I met you and you opened me up to a whole new thing with our, you know, with, with, with flipping properties and stuff. So it's just been, there's too much opportunity to, to go back to where I was. Cause I, I truly wasn't happy there. Even if I had income and had everything that portion, I truly wasn't fulfilled and happy doing it. So never want to go back to it and you just learn from it and, and keep going on. Now, before we get into like all the flipping homes and all that stuff, um, mm -hmm. We already went through a recession in 2008. So you mm -hmm. learned a lot from that. I know right now, you know, we're finally getting out of all this pandemic. Still, we don't know what the fuck is going to happen the rest of 2020, right? What's going to happen? Yeah. What's, what level seven of Jumanji you bring in next month, right? <laughs> yeah, but yeah, of course. From what you learned in 2008 to what we're going through right now, have you implemented the same strategy to get through it or there's something new that you have implemented during this time? Uh, right now is a totally in in my eyes the the housing market is is a totally different beast right now i mean in in 08 we were we were trying to figure out how to get people to to keep their homes right now it's not because interest rates were adjusting and things were going in in a totally different way and people were getting foreclosed upon very very quickly right now there was obviously they've implemented the you know, allowing people with the forbearances to, to be able to keep their home. The thing is that people that are getting by right now, their mortgages are, are fixed rates. So we're not concerned about adjusting on, on rates and, and payments, you know, just skyrocketing on them where that's what people were, was real deal and being in prepayment penalties where they couldn't afford. I, I don't feel that the, the values of the homes are going to are going to diminish like they did back in 08. And I mean, with all those foreclosures, just constantly slamming on top of it made it much more difficult. I, I do think that we may run into a little problem here when these for, forbearances um, start to come due, because I think a lot of people aren't thinking of what a forbearance is and, and what the reality is. I mean, they are allowing you to postpone or defer some payments, but when that is over, you owe real money plus the interest that's accrued on it and you have to pay that back all at once too so and i want to kind of back that up just a little bit so yeah. people understand what, what you're saying here is that okay if i get a six month forbearance and my and my house payment's two thousand dollars okay that two thousand dollars is adding up every month so that by the time that hey it's due it's not a, it's not okay give me two thousand dollars and make this payment it's give me two thousand give me the others too so that's 12,000, right? Yeah. And well, and I mean, yes and no. I mean, it is definitely all due, but there are some, some options that, that are out there. I mean, you can, they, they do a, like a graduated payment where you can do, you know, double payments for X amount of time, or you can pay it in full, or it could be, you know, there's, I feel that modifications are probably going to start to come back and become a little more prominent. But the problem is, is the guy who just lost his job right now, that's Sure. Not going to have a job for three or five months and he's got his family and they're in their house and he's going to get his job back and he's going to tell the, he's going to tell his mortgage company, Hey, I'm, I got my job. I'm, I'm going to start making payments. And they're like, great. Well, now you owe for the last four or five, six, whatever the case may be months. And now that guy's not going to know what to do because he's obviously depleted savings, doesn't have them. So that that's where my concern comes in. And I, I really hope that there's some things that get put in place to, to help these folks. Um, but, you know, we, 
we won't know. And unfortunately, I feel it's probably going to be right around Christmas time when we start to see a lot of um, the, the hardships that are that are going to ensue from from this. But you know, we just gotta we gotta keep moving forward, and hopefully, you know, things have once COVID and people are getting their jobs back. I, I hope that we we can see things recover the way that we have since since 08. I mean, no one thought that we were ever going to, our, our economy was done for life. The dollar was never going to be, we were going to need new money. And look at where we went from 08 to, to now, well, right before COVID. Um, the economy was stronger than ever. People were making more money than ever. And, you know, it's it's the American way. We'll figure a way around it and we'll, we'll prosper from it. But, you know, there's, there's going to be, there's going to be some hardships along the way for sure. Do you, do you see, and I'm going to kind of piggyback on what Pedro was saying there too. Has your business specifically the mortgage industry, are you guys pivoting in a sense that you're going to find yourself like real estate agents and so forth, where they're doing more zoom calls, where they're doing more uh, electronic signatures, you know, where everything's kind of becoming as a little less face to face or in person to you know over 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 the web you know is that is that where the industry is going? i don't i mean you're gonna hear people argue it both ways but honestly purchase market slowed down significantly when we were when we were in quarantine and there were doing virtual showings and all of these different things i mean it's really hard to try to buy a house and never step foot in it. I personally wouldn't do it. I mean, a lot of people transfer in and out of states that, that do it consistently, but I mean, closings are definitely starting to become hybrid where you can, you know, you can close and fill out a lot of your documents before you come to closing and just have to do some core um, things that they need to have notarized and have you there present for. But um, I, yes and no. I mean, there's, there's always going to be a level of somebody who's going to want digitally everything and there's always going to be the people who are going to want a human because you and a machine cannot give you emotion it, it can't it, it can't empathize with you it can't relate to certain things i mean there's a relationship that is built in every one of those transactions whether it's uh, a relationship where you're going to get referral business out of it or a relationship that it's transactional and then they're they're one and done but during that time i mean if you've taken care of them properly you should have no problem um, getting future business from them. And I'll tell you too, you know, just, you know, from, from our talks this year too, you know, we've, we've talked about some negative things here, but man, it's been a great year to be in the mortgage business too, with the refinancing and so forth. Right. It, it's been amazing of, for, for, I mean, I, I think across the board for, if you're a loan officer and you haven't been crushing it the last few months, you probably should, should leave the industry. I mean, it has rates are, still historically low. I mean, yes, there's quite a few people who've lost jobs, but there are still a ton of people that, that didn't lose jobs. And there's still a ton of people that are still in a position to, um, to purchase. And I mean, with the way rates are, if you're presenting options, right, there's, there's something out there for, for the majority of people that have been in mortgages for sure. And tell us a little bit about for, for the, for the, the new investors that are listening in that maybe, you know, they're not looking for a quick fix and flip, you know, with a hard money loan or anything like that, but somebody that maybe wants, you know, to get into the, like a rental type uh, atmosphere, kind of start building up their, their housing portfolio and so forth. They've already got a house, you know, family and kids and everybody's sitting there right there. They want to buy additional house. What does that look like? What does that picture look like for them? First time investors, I, I, I tell them, make sure you understand that this isn't, an income generating property today. Like when you when you buy that home and you get a renter in it, you can't assume that you're going to charge a rent that's going to pay you five or six hundred dollars on top of the mortgage payments or whatever the case may be to where you're just this is a cash cow. It's what you're looking for is you're looking for an opportunity for an investment and not a today investment. It, it's going to be a long term investment where whoever's living in that home is making that mortgage payment while your property is appreciating and you're building equity for a, a later time. And a lot of new investors kind of get into it and they're thinking that they're just, I'm going to get five of these and I'm going to be making three or $4,000 a month off of it. And I'll be able to just flip them. And that's, that's not the reality of it because when you're buying, when you're selling, there's costs associated with those 
um, with those transactions. So it, it's not just always a just quick fix and flip on, on some of these. When you're getting something where you're getting an, a, a rental property um, and you're paying closer to a, a market value on it in, in regards to where when you're flipping, you know, obviously you're probably getting something that's under market value because of factors, renovations or whatever needs to be done to it. Um, you're looking at it for when you want to get rid of that property to have a, a nice gain off of it, not the monthly. You want them to be able to pay your mortgage payment, have some money that you've set aside to, you know, maintenance, repairs, whatever the case may be. Um, but don't think of it as a right now, I'm going to make money off of this property. And, and just to get down into the nu actual nuts and bolts of that, what, do, what does it look like? You know, as far as, you know, if I were to come to you today and say, hey, I've already got a house, but I want to buy another house for a rental property. What do the qualifications look like? And what are, I mean, are they, I know that they're a little bit different. Sometimes the down payments change, maybe the, even the interest rates change. You know, tell us a little bit of what that what looks like, you know, for somebody that's looking to, to get into that type of opportunity. Yeah, I mean, immediately right out of the gate, you, you do still have to qualify for your current home and the investment property, it, it is going to require, it is going to require you to put down 20% um, at minimum for, to get a rate that's going to be feasible for you and make you happy. Um, otherwise you're, you know, it's going to be a little bit higher than what your, your traditional rate is, but you do have to qualify for both of those, um, both of those payments with your current income that you have. So, and I always recommend you, you're going to need to have some reserves set aside and even for qualifications, I mean, up to six months in some of these COVID, um, some of the COVID guidelines have changed with some investors needing, wanting you to have 12 months um, reserve requirements to show that you have your principal interest, taxes, insurance, and the association dues um, in a reserve account. So it can get very costly upfront in just showing that you need that, but obviously, getting into it and you get a renter who's good and hopefully stays in your property for a while and you don't have to go through that portion. It, it definitely has its advantages for, for long-term. I gotcha. Good stuff. So from your perspective, as a, as at, from a loan perspective, do you want the, do you get excited? And, and, and I mean, are those the types of folks that, that when they come to you and they talk to you about getting, you know, taking out a secondary mortgage, you know, is that, a, is that a different kind of conversation, you know, with them, you know, because it's like, okay, man, if they fold on this, you know, this could be a bad loan. And then, you know, it's going to be, it's going to have a of trickle course. effect and we're going to lose money and all of this stuff. I mean, do you, do you want that type of person coming to you or? Absolutely. I mean, you, the joys of seeing somebody, if they've gotten a, gotten bought their first house and, or bought their first investment property, there, there's, it's an emotional roller coaster, no matter how you want to do it. You go through the excitement of like, yes, I'm going to do this. And then you go through the, oh shit, can I afford this? What if I don't get a renter in here? What if this is going to happen? And all of those negatives. And, you know, I just, I try to make sure that I make the process as, as efficient as possible for them so that there's no, uh, there's no questions along the way of the, the financing portion. And when you make yourself readily available for those, Henry, hey, I'm having a question right now. What if I know you told me this, but this rate's not going to change? Is my, you know, is my payment going to increase? No, you know, your your interest rate's fixed. You just have to make sure that you're you're keeping up your property, keeping your your tenants in there. Make sure you're doing the work up front and not just finding the guy that you're out at the grocery store and hear him talking about he needs a property and you just you need to get somebody in there and don't do a qualification on them. Just as you have to qualify to get in the mortgage, you need to qualify the person who's going to rent the house from you because there's that can cause them more problems than than not. I mean you get a bad tenant in there who you know, we've seen it through houses that you and I've gone through. I mean they're they destroy everything, they strip everything out. I mean you could then what are you going to do if if it's your first property and you spent all this money up front. And then now you're really jeopardizing your, your, your home property, you know, home base. Uh, yeah, because I mean, you, you start defaulting on things or you start trying to move cash one way or another, it, it can definitely put you into a financial rut. So I, I just tell everyone, make sure that you're, you do the work up front. You may have to tell the first two people no, but I'll tell you what, telling those two people no is probably going to save you thousands of dollars down the road because you have to evict the bad tenant. You've got to 
you have to incur all these court costs and yeah, great. It's going to go on their credit. Well, we know what happens with that. I mean, if, if once someone's there, it's, it's on your credit and you'll get paid if, and when you get paid, you know what I mean? And there's, but you still have a house and you still have a payment that you have to make until they decide they're going to pay you back off of that judgment or lien that you have to place against them. So it's, it, it's exciting, obviously. And then you definitely have to have that, that awareness of something going wrong. Sure. Right. No doubt. Oh, that's crazy. Um, well, you know, obviously you've had a lot of success in the mortgage industry, man. You've done great for yourself and, and built an amazing team, an amazing business and a, mm -hmm. and a fairly lucrative one as well. Let's, let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about house flipping. What has that been like for you? I, I only <laughs> ask this because we're partners in this, man, you know, so it's a completely different ball game. We've walked into a lot of interesting scenarios before and, and, and it's really a different game. You know, tell us a little bit about what that was like for you going from a traditional mortgage business, you know, where yeah. things are much, there's a lot more procedures and, and, and everything's a little bit more streamlined to what the hell is this? <laughs> yeah. Just, I, I, I'll tell you, man, I, I'd like to say I'm one of the most, I feel that I'm one of the more knowledgeable people within this industry. But once we got into the house, that, flipping portion, you know, you much as anybody knew when I was like, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it's a totally different entity. I, I was overwhelmed in the beginning when you and I first started. It was, it, it was humbling to know that there's a whole nother portion of this game that I had no knowledge on and going in there and from being on the mortgage side, I don't care what repairs need to be done, what things are, are going to happen post closing but here we are about to purchase a home and that it, it's totally different when it's looking at finding every single thing that's wrong making sure we were all the title issues we've had and you know uh, probate and i was just thrown off because I, I mean it was uh it, but you know now that i've learned on it every single transaction you and i've done we've we've went through something on and had to learn <laughs> had to learn along the way as we've went about to rip our hair out a few times, but I mean, it's, it, it's awesome. And getting into it was definitely the first time I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. And <laughs> now I, now I wouldn't want to do it any other way. I mean, it's great. It's just and, getting and over that what, first step. I think that this is kind of, I know that you're all about helping folks and, and educating them and trying to get them lifted up into a better scenario. Uh, I think that I feel like whenever you came into the business that, that, you know, that this gave you an opportunity to even take that a, a step farther because now the people that you're dealing with are, are in hurt, they're in pain, you know, they've had some sort of life circumstance Absolutely. really gotten them into a, a tough situation. And I know that me and you, you know, and I talk about this, you know, to folks, uh, you know, on our other shows and, and to, to other people looking into getting into the industry that, you know, rather than talk about numbers and, and repairs and, you know, what the house is value and stuff like that. Me and you don't even talk about that stuff till like an hour we're into this. We sit down at the table and we're like, okay, so how do we get here? You know, take us back, right? You know, so what has that been like for you? You know, shifting gears. That portion isn't, wasn't as hard for me at all, just due to the fact that, <clears throat> as I tell all my loan officers the same way, friends first and then business later. So build that rapport, get get in, learn their pain points, learn, learn why they're needing to get rid of this property, you know, learn in the mortgage side on the flip side, I'm, I'm wanting to know why you're wanting to purchase, you know, what's, what's the reason? Is it just because it's typically not, it's I want to be a homeowner, you know, my, my mom and dad own multiple homes and I want to finally, I want to own one, you know, it's, there, there's always a reason behind it. I'm going to be having kids and I need to, you know, I don't want to live in an apartment anymore. And then when our side, it's, you know, I, I just have to get rid of this because my mom died or, you know, my my dad passed away and I just don't want anything to do with the house and I, I need to get rid of it. So um, that portion is probably the easiest part that we've had to do because that was the easiest transition for me. But um, by building that rapport and getting to know somebody, you're not going in there like, OK, so what's your bottom dollar for this house? What's wrong with it? No, you go in and we work really well with getting in there and, and really digging into a person's situation and, and learning about their life. Cause it, it helps you out throughout the transaction for sure. 
And and it's a, I think I truly feel this way that it's a little bit different for us than it is for a lot of our competitors that are out there that are that are wanting to do the same thing. And mm-hmm. and I think it's because we kind of wear our hearts on our sleeve. We genuinely care about these folks. We genuinely care about the situation. We genuinely want to get them into something better. Um, yes, of course, we want to make some money. We want to win and so forth. But we both recognize that we're not really winning until somebody else is winning first. You know what I mean? And so, man, you know, for me, you know, you hear all of these different situations on how they, they got to, to, to these levels. And man, it tugs at your heart, you know, a little bit. Uh, you know, I know that last week we went, we went and, and visited with a, a guy that had, you know, he dreamed his whole life of starting his, his own trucking business, trucking company. Having, his own, having his own truck, got his own truck. Everything's just going great for a couple of years. And then, you know, at the end of last year, you know, he started having problems with the truck. You know, when those things break down, it's like 15, 20, 25 grand. And he had back to back to back. Okay. And then, so he's in a situation where, man, I can't, you know, afford to pay for this truck. And then, okay, well, I made a little bit more money. Let me, let me pay for the truck, but now I can't pay for the insurance on it. And then now, because I can't pay for the insurance on it, I I lost my license. So now I'm going to lose my truck and I can't go and work for another trunk trucking company because I don't have a license. And now I can't pay my mortgage. And now it, you know, it's, it's falling apart. And man, we hear those stories all the time they're not always the same of course but man it's it it's it's tough and and it can be weighing on on your emotions and on your mindset and and so forth but i know that we're the right folks to really come in there and and help them out where a lot of people might just come in there and try to try to take advantage of them right absolutely i mean and how many times do we hear it someone's either came in super high trying to offer them a price that we know is not rea- reality and then in three weeks, we hear back from them saying, well, this person came in with this super high offer that I, you know, told you guys you were crazy for what you were telling me. And now they came in after adjustments and whatever they said were repairs. They're another 20 grand below where, where our initial offer was. And I mean, it's, it's one thing when you put your best foot forward first, you know, obviously sometimes we have to sit back and, and wait for other people's true colors to show up. But ultimately when you're, when you're doing the right thing and you're, you're keeping honesty and integrity first and foremost in your business it's always going to pay dividends for you in the long run which is the key to be successful man you know especially in this industry when you're where you're flipping homes or you're doing wholesaling like you said you literally most of the people you talk to is people that are going through some hard situation in life and and why are you going to take advantage of that that makes you a piece of shit i believe (laughs) i mean it, it it's 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 very difficult up front for a lot of us when we're even as a mortgage with all the people who did all of the things bad back in the day with deceiving people, there's still a level of fear that people have and they have a wallet because they don't trust. They're afraid that someone's going to do something, you know, to deceive them just as when we come in on some of these houses, we've got to sit down and really, really dig in with them and let them see that we're humans and we care and we have hearts and families and you know lives and we can really relate with what they're going through before we can start to get into a transaction and start talking money because when you come in and just start saying like when I told you I got in the industry and I was calling people not knowing what to do can I have your social well, how, how impersonal <laughs> is that I mean let's let's be honest yeah. I mean that's it, it's bad and if we just came in and was like, what's your lowest dollar amount? Well, they don't have a level of compassion. They don't care. There's no emotion involved in it. And it, it's probably not going to bode well for you most of the time. So that's, that's what I love about when we sit down and we're, we're going to be there for an hour and a half. And we tell everybody it's going to take us that long. And they think, well, walking through the house isn't very long. But yeah, we're going to sit there. And I don't care about walking through the house as much as I care about sitting at your kitchen table too learn about you and what your situation is and, and what we can do to, to better help you. Right. Which is the right thing to do. You know, like, yeah, it, it is a business, you know, like you have, of I course. think, I think it's a balance between having that moral obligation of doing the right thing, but also, you know, we, we all have to be helping them at the end of the day, but you also making, you're providing for your family, which is, I believe right now in COVID, I, I, I have seen that a lot, man. Like all these people complaining about small businesses and other people trying to keep their business running, you know, and all these people like trying to make them feel bad because of that. It's like, no, man, like, you don't, you cannot feel bad because of that. I mean, you also have an obligation, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so. exactly. And you just, 
sometimes you just need to put the blinders on and you know what's best for you and forget what everything's going on. Shut the TV off. Don't pick up your phone for a while and just do what you need to do to better your situation. Because ultimately at the end of the day, the naysayers are still going to be the naysayers, regardless of you saving your business, building your business, whatever the case may be. They're not going to have any part of your your wins or your losses they're going to continually be a negative bandwagon with you so you just got to kind of you first and 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 go forward i love it man and i feel like it's a win-win situation for us you know because we're truly able to help folks get into a better situation and the reality of it is is that it is a it's a it's a lucrative industry as well where there is money to be made so what better, what, what better opportunity is there than when you can help somebody else get into a better situation and help your family and your, and, and your families as well and to, to get into a better situation? Um, you know, we've, we've been fortunate, you know, to, to do really well on, on some of the properties, you know, mm-hmm. some help with the, the wholesaler cheat code here. Uh, ab- That's absolutely. made it a little bit easier too. Uh, I definitely, uh, I definitely would not have had any success on uh, I, as much success through this without, without your, uh, without your expertise with that cheat code. I, I definitely, that is a, that is an absolute for sure. It sure, it sure beats driving for dollars for eight hours a day or something like that, or, you know, cold calling on folks that, that, you know, again, you know, kind of like back, you know, in your pre-mortgage days, um, dude, you're the 50th person to call me today. I'm not interested. And you're so excited about that property. You know, it took you so long to find it. You skip trace, you find the owners and then bam, you know, you're blind. Uh, yeah. You're, you're exactly where the, the last three guys that were driving around for the last three days have, have found. So, you and, know, we, you, you let me talk you into doing that two times and I'll tell you, it, I, I definitely will we'll take the, the wholesale cheat code over that any day. That was a lot of uh, driving and a lot of time for uh, definitely the results were nowhere near as good as, as what we get from, from the leads that we're acquiring now. It, it, it sure makes it a lot easier and a lot more fun too whenever they're calling you, right? Well, that, that, makes <laughs> it, <laughs> uh, uh, that, that absolutely. I mean, that's, that was my transition from, cold calling into coming to countrywide. I mean, I just pressed a button and I had people. It was, it was definitely an eye opening experience. I mean, times are definitely changing those door knocking and driving for dollars. I mean, it, it does work. I mean, it is, but it's, it's just like saying you're going to mail something, but let someone on horseback take it, you know, two states <laughs> over. It's, it's going to take some time. It's, it's just a lot more work to, to render results. Definitely. Well, just a couple quick uh, questions. And I know you got a, a lot to, to take care of and then you're a busy man, but let me ask you this. You do a lot, you know, you've got your mortgage business. It's going great. We've got our, we've got our, uh, you know, our, our, house, our home investment business where we're flipping properties. How do you manage all of that? And then, you know, have a wife and two kids, one of them being a brand newborn. You know, <laughs> how, how, how do you, stay on track and, and keep focused, you know, amidst all that. I, I'll tell you, man, it, it's, it's not easy at times because especially now, you know, I, I want to be around my family a lot, but you, you've got to make sure when I'm, when I'm working, uh, I'm working and that, that's it. I'm not going to sit here and try to, to be playing around on the internet. I, I just make sure that what I'm doing at that point in time, I am focused on and getting the task at hand when I'm at home in the evenings. I mean, how many times I told you I, I'm not going to talk to you until after eight 30, once I put Xander to bed I, and because that's my time and I want to be there. I don't want him to, uh, I caught myself too many times in the past, just having my phone. I'd be sitting down with him while he's doing a puzzle and I'm, I'm on my phone. Like, that's not cool. Like I don't need to reply to a text message then you just have to prioritize your day. And I mean, I, I've really gotten into time blocking and making sure that I, I am doing what I'm supposed to be when I'm saying I'm doing it. Cause if I don't, and I try to write down a to-do list, I, that's never going to work for me. Cause I, just as we were talking about the gym earlier, if I don't put something like that into my schedule, it's definitely not going to get done, man. And that's, you, you're never going to have a perfect balance, but when you have that time, you have to make sure that you're, you're there and you're present for it. Definitely. No doubt. Well, just one last quick question for you, man. Yeah, for the folks that are listening that are either in uh, the mortgage business 
uh, or on the investing side or, or the house flipping side or anything like that, what do you feel like is the biggest piece of advice that you'd give to either one of them to get on a path towards success in the shortest amount of time? I mean, there's not a, there's, there's not a shortest amount of time. There's just putting in the time. I mean, and when it clicks, it clicks. You may learn a lot faster than I learned, you know, so your, your time may be a little bit shorter to start yielding results. But as long as you are focusing on what you're supposed to do and you're putting in the effort, it's going to come. The fruits of the labor are there. They never, never go unknown without, as long as that work and that effort is put in, I promise you, our society these days is so soft. You can go through and, and take business by just doing work. There's so many people out there that are so passive with, they're just complacent. They're not keeping their relationships strong if they're if they're investors they're not they're not keep you know the realtors aren't keeping their their relationships with those investors there's loan officers who aren't keeping their relationships with their their clients nor with their their agents and it happens all the time i call and i'm like yeah i got this great loan officer i work with awesome well they start talking to them and start digging in then before you know it's like well they don't really do much they don't say much but you know sometimes they close loans on time and sometimes they have an issue it's but i just stay with it and i'm like well hey i don't want to intervene i'm just going to keep doing the work and as i do the work eventually someone comes over hey hadn't talked to you in a minute i i got this person and so and so didn't answer this time oh great and just put the work in and it will come that's it, man. Uh, you know, put in the work and trust the process and never quit. You know, it all come together. It absolutely does, man. Absolutely. It's that simple. So suck the struggle. <laughs> uh, it, it is tough. Hey, it is a struggle, man. There's not, it, it's that easy, but it's not easy. I mean, you have to stay right. disciplined and you have to put the work in. I mean, there's no, you know, with our mentors, we know that there, there is not a secret path. There's not a shortcut. It is, just it, do the work. <laughs> everything's work required, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. You you're going to you're gonna have to roll up the sleeves, man. It's, it's for sure. In this book, High Performance Habits, actually, mm -hmm. this guy talks about the struggle and how uh, if you want to be successful, you better, that's, you better embrace it, <laughs> you know, because it's just part of the process of being successful. So yep. stop running away from that shit. <laughs> uh, absolutely, man. It, it's not going to go anywhere. And I mean, if you, you're going to waste your time, you go back and sit on the couch then. Cause I mean, honestly, if you're going to half ass it, it's, it's never going to, it's never going to work for you. you yeah, you've got to find the time and, and prioritize it. For sure, yep. man. Well, Henry, I'd like to say thanks again for coming on today, man. Yeah, I appreciate it guys. I'm really thankful. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And it, it's been great. And, um, look forward to watching more of your shows for sure. Definitely, yeah, man. man. So, how, how, where can uh, folks get in touch with you if, if they should need, you know, uh, a, a mortgage loan, or they have any questions about mortgages, or, or you know, somebody that just wants to to kind of get a better understanding of what you're doing, so that they can replicate that. How can I get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. You can call me on my cell phone two one four four nine two three eight four eight, or you can reach me at Henry dot Araujo A R A U J O at N R L Mortgage dot com. Sweet man, awesome, good stuff, Th guys. Thank you. I really appreciate the show, it, man. man. Thank you, oh, guys. Hope to see you soon. Grab a beer with you soon, man. Absolutely, right. man. We definitely will. That's yeah, right. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, man. Brother. You have a good one, man. Take All care. Right. Thank Stay you, gentlemen. Later, guys.